this is, this is, this is. Anyway, uh, I, I'm excited, man. I really, really digging your new tunes. Uh, Thank you. Excited to get into what you've been up to and and where you're headed. Yeah. So uh, thanks for being on, Ian Cook. It's it's been yeah. Thank a, you. It's been a while. Tumble down days I know. for me. I know. I what was it? El Corazon. Right? Yeah, I think we we like, uh, we supported you at El Corazon. Um, yeah, probably like around 2012 13? or 13. 2012. Yeah, something like Somewhere that. Somewhere in there. I think 2013 was really the last show we played was that year, or last okay, shows yeah. we played. Uh, technically, we're still together. You know, we're yeah. on hiatus. Yeah. Open book. <laughs> a Just deep, leave it an open book. <laughs> a deep <laughs> slumber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. But you, yeah, but uh, Larry and his flask was always a band that was a cut above most of the bands that I saw out there oh. on the road. Yeah, Thank you, man. And, and no different for, you know, your new band. Uh, what? So w tell me about it. What? What's it? What's it called? What happened? Well, what? What happened with yeah. Larry? Beyond the Lamplight is kind of the new thing, and it's it's essentially kind of like the continuation of the sound and everything. Some stuff happened that just kind of made Larry not feasible to continue, and so it was just kind of like the other main songwriter and I, the banjo player Andrew Carew, um, just kind of. We both kind of needed some time off the road anyway, so Larry kind of came to a, a kind of an abrupt halt, and we all kind of just like picked up the pieces for a couple of years, and then. Uh, what year was that? To, that that happened. That was uh, twenty seventeen, mm. twenty eighteen, maybe something like that. So you guys uh, were hard road, like from when we saw you, you guys kept going for you know five, six yeah. years, more oh, than yeah. that even. I mean, Totally. I mean, it, we took a we took a hiatus shortly after we saw you guys. I feel like 2013, 2014, we actually took about a year off the road. That was like our first kind of it was always like, you know, we pushed so hard from the beginning. It was like, you know, we started hard touring, you know, around, somewhere around 2007, 2008. And then we were on the road for, you know, nine to ten months a year, every year for, from then all the way up until 2013 or 14. And and you know lots of shit happens <laughs> in between those times and you grow and everything you know families and crazy shit and everything so it's like we got to a point where we had to take a little break and then we kind of got back together on a like a little bit more of a like a controlled basis when we kind of did that last kind of stint it was like shorter tours not as much like grinds trying to make things more feasible for everybody's lives but it all it eventually kind of just came to a came to another stop we just kind of all got burnt out pretty quickly again and then we all just kind of decided to let it lie for a while <laughs> yeah but and what uh, did you do um i started uh i did a well when the pandemic started i kind of and that wasn't too long after we had been off the road really and i, I had been working on a batch of solo material and I, I finally like recorded a whole solo record here in my little studio down here and put that out and then I started playing with another band called The Old Revival, who has another singer songwriter in town, like a more of a rock and roll band. I'm just a side man and I play the guitar in that band. And uh, we recorded a record with that band and then the pandemic hit and it totally went to shit. And we had we couldn't tour on it or do anything with it either. So it's like and then I started to just write. I sat down and I just wrote what was the lead single that just came out for beyond the lamplight and i was like wow that just came out of nowhere and it was like that sound that i mm. that kind of larry sound that i had hadn't written in that style in in a couple of years and it just kind of naturally came out I'm like maybe i do maybe i do want to do something like this you know and then it just kind of snowballed from there i got i called andrew or banjo player and was like what do you think about trying something you know and then it just kind of i a batch of songs a couple songs just kind of poured out after that we got together and we said fuck it let's just do an ep <laughs> let's throw yeah. it together and uh see what happens you know and it just kind of snowballed into the into it being like a real band and and uh started working with our buddy's label and and yeah here we are i guess <laughs> yeah i feel like creativity really needs space whether or not you give yeah. it the space is one thing but like if you can give it space you're always ready to to you know you're inspired something comes out and, and yeah i you agree need that it's time. like it's it's that old adage of uh, it's similar to like like when you only you always find love when you're not looking for love kind of thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you know, and so it's like it's like you take a rest and you're like, fuck that, I never want to see those guys again, and then like all of a sudden it's just like something happens and it all just starts coming back 
at the last minute, you know, where you don't even think that it's going to happen. It's like it just coming. And uh, that's kind of what happened with this with these new songs. And we just kind of rolled with it. Yeah. Do you feel like you're going to tour like you did with Larry with this new, you know, Beyond the Lamplight band? Uh, I mean, I don't, I think I, we definitely want to tour for yeah. sure. 100%. Um, but, uh, probably not as definitely not as hard as with Larry. I mean, I'm a father of two four-year-old twins and, uh, and so it's like, you know, that definitely changes the dynamic a little bit as far as the road. I mean, you know, it does. And so, so like, what's the hardest know. part about that? I mean, is it, um, I'd probably say just s staying in, in some sort of like normal touch like as far as like having a having like a rhythm with with mm -hmm. like with that because like it's always at like some little tiny bit of time you have somewhere at the end of the night or the beginning of the night or somewhere in this little thing and like they're not always available and like trying to like make the scheduling work between like staying in contact was always something really tough like especially like when you're in europe and then you're trying to make the make the time you know you're it's like you're about it's three in the morning for you and they're waking up you know and it's just mm -hmm. like i had a great night you know like <laughs> they're like sweet i gotta get the kids ready you know yeah it's like it's not it's not really you know it's something that i you know i feel like takes some some work to like kind of hone that in and you know kind of just get it under control I yeah guess, yeah for I, sure. you know i've experienced that myself like you get in a good rhythm you can do facetime if you're on the road but mm -hmm. if enough time passes, their schedule is going to change or your schedule is going to change. Somehow you miss a day and yeah. then it's just screwed or whatever. But totally. But yeah, having a rhythm with kids, I think, is the really the most important thing. Having some sort of like scheduling. Uh, yeah. Behaviorally, the they know what. Yes. Yeah, structure is great. Yeah, yeah. They know what to expect mm -hmm. from their day. And it creates a lot less anxiety and, and all the worries yeah. that kids totally. have. Totally. Because it can it can pour into their life and attitude as well. Like just, just a change of surroundings and the change of their structure can pour into just, they, it could just totally derail that like emotionally there, you know, mm -hmm. for them as well, you know? So it's like, it's pretty important to kind of stay on top of that and it can get pretty kind of hectic for sure out on the road. That's cool. I mean, there's nobody, I mean, people these days pretty, I think kind of understand that, that, even musicians, even their favorite artists have families and have things that, yeah. oh, enter. I mean, that definitely didn't seem to be a thing uh, 20 years ago or, or whatever. No, yeah, you know? like the whole facade of like this single guy who's on stage, you know, like the, the Neil Diamond with his chest hair and like, yeah. like he's got a family that he goes home to and a wife that he loves and like, you know, but like the whole persona of the, of the guy on stage or whatever, you know, yeah, it's not, it's I, not really the same anymore. There's a funny, there's a funny story. Like Pitbull is a good example of that. He's oh, like yeah. this guy that has all these ladies dancing on stage with him all the time. It's, it's booty, yeah. booty, sh booty shaking music, whatever, you know, totally. yeah, but oh, yeah. it, he's a family man and he goes after the show, he'll get on his private jet and he'll fly back to Florida <laughs> yeah, totally. and hang with his family, you know, or whatever. I mean, that's pretty cool. Like, I, I, there's all types of people is, is that's all that is, you know, there's, there's plenty of people that are out there partying their asses off too. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, we've seen our fair share of that too. Oh, and been the, been those people. Either yes, time. yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. a lot of it is the sort of glamour, <laughs> the glamour of touring, it, and and it's the memories that we we sort of like. We know that there's bad times. There's there's boring parts, but I think everything else makes up for that. The just the the experiences you have. Um, one, you know, you build incredible bonds with with your bandmates. Sometimes yeah, it breaks up the band, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> know. yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, how how sure. much of it is that you think? Like the the idea of touring is it is it something you just literally do because it's something you need, or is it let's make let's do this as a job again? Uh, Which is I both mean, is okay. I think it's kind of both. I mean, I think the like the, a little bit of the of the glamour. I mean, not to over romanticize it but like you know it is it has its charm you know uh, being on the road and and it's something that like you know i joined larry's flat like we, i joined larry's flat when we started i was 16 years old you know like i've been in this band since i was a sophomore in high school you know <laughs> and so like and we were just a shitty punk band a high school band you know and it was like and we went on our first tour that first summer you know like we went out for two weeks and played five shows <laughs> you know it's like and uh so it was like, 
it's it's all I've really ever known since like I haven't I, I never you know I never went to college never really had a real job or even a career path at all it was like right into I mean you can relate to that right into mm-hmm. being in a band touring and and what doing did, that you know so it's did, like it's a part it's a huge part of who I am you know how did your parents react to that like at 16 they, their baby's going on tour yeah my mom not so stoked <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine but my they were really supportive my dad um was the one who actually started me off playing guitar. He was a musician. He played in bands through this, like from high school of his age all the way through the seventies and, uh, and had his own band until he was around and he was in his thirties and then he finally settled down, you know? So like he's, he definitely did it for, for a long time as well. So I think he was pretty, he was happy to, that I was getting into it, I think. And was like, they were always super supportive and, and like, and, uh, you know, we're, but my mom was obviously really worried getting in a van with a bunch of kids and go, driving all the way to Arizona in the middle of the summertime when you're yeah. 16 years old, you know? But, yeah. How did you, I mean, when did you start playing, for one? Uh, is guitar your main instrument? Because you play multiple instruments, correct? And uh, Yeah. Wh- where did you get your start in music? Because you're an amazing musician and great songwriter, great great singer. Wow, Where's that man. come from? Um, I started off playing guitar when I was nine, I was nine years old. Nine. That's a good age. It was, uh, yeah, I was really, it was pretty early. I mean, I have, I I have a much different kind of, uh, kind of path, I guess, than most like people that ended up in the scene. Um, as far as, as far as where I started, I started as a blues player, which you kind of started. I've listened to some of the pod, your podcast. You talked about how you started playing blues on bass. Like that's pretty kind of, I got your start and learning that stuff. And that's the same thing with me. I was like, just a total blues nerd. And I, I was like, you know, from, from the age of nine to, until I started to hit, you know, you know, early teens, I was, that's all I wanted to do was just, you know, play blues my parents would actually when i was like 10 11 12 they would take me to like local blues jams and local bars and i would go sit in with blues bands and go play and that was like you know a huge education as such a young player like to get in with other players and like start taking like cues from band members and like starting to get this whole idea of like playing with other people when i'm you know 12 years old and was pretty pretty awesome so I had I I had already done a lot of that like playing with other people by the time I got to kind of like into punk and I started to do that when I was in my early teens and then so I was bringing all that to the punk bands that I kind of like was playing with, um, but yeah it was a, it was it was really it was really fun and educational you know all that so those early years of playing for sure that's insane and, man yeah keep going on about the I mean. Blues is a great way to start. I mean, it really is sort of the the basis of rock and roll and, and even yep. country. And so totally. much punk rock is based in blues scales. I and, mean, yeah. I mean, just the one, four, five, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, that's like straight up, that's a Ramon song, but it's also every single blues song, you know, it's like, um, and so it's like, I think it was, it was something that was, it was around that time too, which was like the late nine or like mid nineties, late nineties where those like young blues guitar player kids were like getting really big, you know, like Johnny Lang and, and, uh, yeah. Kenny Wayne Shepherd and all those like kid Derek trucks when he was really young and like all that stuff. And so it was like, I idolized, I wanted to be one of those young blues kids. It was like, if they can do it, I can do it, you know, kind of thing. And so it really pushed me to like learn more. I was a total, you know, all your, like, check off all your boxes, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and, like, you know, Clapton and all the things. I was always like, yeah, they're, you know, I was really into all that stuff. And and I just wanted to learn how to play guitar. And that's all. And I didn't start focusing on songwriting until way, way later. And, like, even paying attention to the words of a song until I was much older, you know. Right. It was like, I was all about just learning how to play guitar. Did you? And that's all, that's all did, I wanted to do. Did you take lessons or did you, how did you learn? Did you teach yourself? What was the uh, yeah, method? Yeah, it was all by ear. It was all my okay. my dad was a was just an ear player, and I I took a handful of lessons, uh, but they never really stuck, and I never I could never really get into it. it. I was you know it was I think it was also one of those unfortunate situations where you just don't get you don't find the right teacher, you know, or like mm-hmm. there's like like I'm 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 here playing like a Stevie Ray Vaughan solo lick or whatever, and they want to bring me back and teach me Mary had a little lamb because they want to teach me how to read music. You know, it's like, I'm just like, so not interested in that. that, Yeah. 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 I just do not want to do that. So, um, so yeah, I I think that we try, my parents tried, but they, they saw that I wasn't really sticking that much and it was just a waste of their money. So, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I just I just kind of stuck it out and just started just learning stuff by ear. I would like I remember I had just a bunch of tapes and I would just throw in throw on some cassettes and just play along. Mm-hmm. I would just solo over stuff and I'd play along in my bedroom. Spend like eight hours a day just with my door closed playing guitar. Just like all I did all the day all of the fucking time. It's crazy. It's kind of crazy to think about it now. I haven't really thought about it in a long time. How how much I was in there. I remember my parents just screaming at me because I would just be like cranking it into the middle of the night, you know, like my parents coming in and throwing shit at me because they're just so pissed. But it's like, hey, you did this. You bought me this amp. You bought me this guitar that I'm going to fucking crank it. (laughs) It's a catch 22 because you want your kid to be so into something that they're going to be a genius level player. Yeah. But it drives you crazy. I can imagine uh-huh. it now. Like, I never. Yeah. I, I try to play in front of my kids, and they always say no. <laughs> you know, because same, same, same thing with my kids. They hate it. They yeah, hate it. they're like, Shh, you know, like stop. No, yeah, yeah. they want to make noise, not me. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They'll take it. They'll take the guitar away from me and smash it. That's yeah. amazing. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, that's how to do it, though. I mean, just play over and over and over so what when did uh when did we can do songwriting or what about other instruments what else do you play i mean well i the, i'm not one of the horn like the horn guys or the other dudes in the band so i as far as like larry i i'm pretty much only play guitar electric guitar and and do the lead vocals i also play the piano that was kind of like my second instrument another thing that i just kind of learned by ear through, you know, music class in elementary school, just kind of picking up stuff. And I just kept doing it throughout the years and just kind of, so I'm a, I'm a decent piano player. Like I can fake it for sure, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm any sort of like real piano, piano player at all, but, but I do, I, I've played keys on the records and stuff like that. And, and all that and I can play and I learned how to play drums along the way somehow I think just like hanging out at my drummer's house and like annoying him and his parents and playing his drum set and pissing him off you know that kind yeah. of thing when you're younger <laughs> just hanging out in the garage for hours um but yeah I just kind of like picking stuff up where I can and just learning how to play it I guess yeah it's hard to get yeah. to the stage where it's fun to play a new instrument because there's 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 that threshold yeah. of I don't know what I'm doing and I suck so bad that this isn't fun but Dude. I, but I know that this sounds ama- like this can sound amazing if I could figure this out, <laughs> like with yeah, banjo. Heard, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I learned how to play banjo, banjo and mandolin. I guess I learned how to play those two just because out of from proxy, let's just because we had a mandolin and banjo player in the band, so yeah, they, those instruments were always laying around. So I just got a chance to kind of figure those out. Um, but yeah, I I know what you mean about that about not knowing like like tr- getting past that threshold because like a few years, maybe 10 years ago now, I got a viola and I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to play, you know, like, and it's just awful, just terrible. (laughs) It's like, well, it's a lifestyle. It's like a lifestyle. It's not an instrument, you know, it's like, you can't, you can't just pick up a bowed instrument and just learn how to play it and and be okay at it in like a couple months. It's just, that's a, you have to start when you're two and you may be good by the time you're 50, (laughs) you know? It's just mind blowing how hard it is to play a violin. Like I have one and (laughs) <laughs> just like I forget oh my I god it's, like, just it's in put the it closet away. it's like screw that man i'm not picking that thing up ever again <laughs> my son yeah. pulls it out he look because he my my son dr- dresses up like a cowboy he's four he'll be five this summer yes. he, he loves to dress up like a cowboy and he loves his fiddle because he he's yeah. kind of like you he's into he doesn't play quite yet but uh he yeah. wants to learn how to play fiddle and he when i put on he loves country music so i put on the, this yeah. guy, Mason Ramsey, he loves Mason. It's a little kid. He's like 14 or something now. But when he started, oh, he was yeah. probably like nine or something. I think I've heard of him, yeah. He's got some real decent songs that you're like, that's catchy, you know. Nice. Uh, but anyway, it, you know, he'll get on and just just emulate just this kid mm-hmm. doing that. And I'm just like, that's, that's great. Man. That's pretty cool that he, he that is cool. found something he loved. So, And it's music-based, yeah. music-based. But he's just like, exactly. Ah, ah, ah. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. Uh, That's good, enough. Yeah. Good job, son. That's how uh, your parents yeah. felt about you, oh, I'm yeah. sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> what a wild yeah. thing, though. But uh, so you just, by proxy, picked up a bunch of instruments. What about songwriting? Like, how did you, what clicked for you? What, can you remember the first um, song you wrote or anything like that? Yeah, well. I feel like I try. I tried to write. I wrote a couple songs. I co-wrote a couple songs with. I have a, a half brother. 
and he was he would come down summers when we were growing up and i we co-wrote some stuff together i remember was i that was maybe like the first i was probably somewhere around 10 or 11 maybe him and i and he would sing them and i would but we'd write them together and i'd play guitar I don't remember how any of them go to this day, but yeah, I think I was maybe a bit that seriously. I probably didn't start writing, so, trying to write songs until I was maybe in around seventh or eighth grade, maybe freshman year, somewhere in there. Um, and it was all, you know, it was all I got in all punk, in, into punk, and it was all like a lot of like pop punk and like you guys, and you know, the whole that whole like mid to late 90s wave of bands was just kind of my that was my time when I was kind of coming of age into that stuff so so I you know in eighth grade I started as you know three-piece pop punk band you know and we we tried to write songs but mostly just played covers but it was nice was a, what was the scene was kind of where, I mean yeah go ahead keep keep going no I that was about it I was it was fun I'm just, and people. that that it's, got it's, you started though like you're totally, writing songs yeah. and what was the scene like in in Bend it was uh we had to a surprising little microcosm for a tiny little town. I mean, it was like, you know, at the time, I think there was only, it was only maybe 20,000 people here or something like that. And, uh, not, and we're way off the corridor too. Like we're way inland from the, from the I five and anything like that. We're like three hours away from Portland. So like we're pretty isolated out here and no bands would really pass through, but we had this cool little, like this cool little scene here, this punk scene that grew and was a really, really like great little tight knit scene of a, a bunch of bands. It was like almost everybody had a band, you know? And so, and like, I remember when Larry started, it was like 2003-ish. And like, even then we were playing every weekend at the local, you know, Grange Hall here, whatever downtown here, that here, you know, like wherever we could. We used, we used to do these things called PRC, punk rock camping, where we would take a generator out to the middle of like BLM, like land, just open out in the middle of nowhere and just invite everybody we possibly could and just lay some plywood down, set the band up and just play a show out in the middle of the woods. You know, like, and there'd be like 200 kids at this show in the middle of fucking nowhere. And like, you know, endless amount of bands because it would just go all night. We'd be so far away from civilization that no one would come out and stop us because nobody could hear it. So it was like we had this like really interesting little like cow town punk scene like that we'd like play out in the middle of nowhere, you know. So it was it was kind of a cool and really unique little place. I mean, there were some bands that were like there were some bands that would pass through, some larger bands that at the time, you know, I don't know if you remember that band Virus Nine for a minute. They were like, Yeah. Yeah. They, they were like working with the anti-flag dudes, I think for a while, or like maybe they're, I don't know, talking to Hellcat or something. Then it all kind of like spiral. I don't know what happened to those guys, but we made good friends with those guys and they would pass through every now and then, but because they were from Southern Oregon, they were from Medford. So it was like, yeah. you know, they would come up, they'd come up to bend and play every now and then. But I mean, there really wasn't very many bands coming through at all. So we just made our own scene out of it, you know, just kind of like, let's do it. You did what you had to do. Yeah. yeah we got nothing else to do. Yeah. Live in a, live in a cow town. It's kind. I mean, it's it, Bremerton had it a little better off because we could f take the ferry over to shows in Seattle. Yeah. But we felt fairly isolated for the most part because there was the Teen Dance Ordinance, which was a law that was passed in in Seattle mainly. But it was like I think it was Washington State ish. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the, the details on that, but it was basically a thing where you couldn't have underage um, shows in a bar even if they weren't oh, serving yeah. or like things like oh, like wow. it was just like the bunch of rules that made it really hard for shows to happen and so most oh, of the bummer. shows happening in seattle were 21 and over and so mm -hmm. because of that in kitsap and you know kitsap county where we are you know we were playing mainly we would just do yeah. our own shows put on our own shows there we didn't even know about it like to be honest like i think i found yeah, out yeah. about the teen dance ordinance later on you know <laughs> but uh -huh, yeah yeah yeah, you just wanted to play music, so you made it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. just the fact that you did it out in the middle of nowhere, that's wild. That's pretty cool. Yeah, what? yeah. It was, it was easier than, and cheaper than renting a VFW hall or whatever. Yeah, no bear attacks? <laughs> no, uh... Yeah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're missing Timmy. Where'd Timmy go? <laughs> yeah, where'd he go? <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing I'd be scared of is, like, wild animals. But know, yeah, when well, there's so many people, it's probably it's scare them. Yeah, off. fortunately around here we don't have any large predators. Like the only thing that around here that's large is like we have like cougars, like mountain lions. That's, but they're like way up. In, okay. They're like high up in elevation though. They don't hang out on the ground, so like, okay. they don't have like it's like coyotes, but they they don't do anything. 
All right, so so it was perfect. It was perfect for <laughs> yeah, a large crowd. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's cool, man. I, that just sounds like the co- like if the cops found out about that, they would. Oh, we got but we got busted a few times. Did I mean, you? It was it it wasn't foolproof. I mean, that's for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> Somebody oh, narc. Man. Somebody narc. <laughs> I don't know. I th- yeah, maybe or some like, jealous or, band or that some, wasn't on the bill. Somebody heard us, or they were just I don't know. I think they caught on after a while because we would do it in the same spot like way too much, like a bunch of dumb kids. <laughs> so like, so they would just, they could just be like, oh yeah, they're probably here. And so they they went out. Like, we got busted one time, and they just gave everybody you know like MIPs and like just slat just like took everybody down, mm. like give them all fat tickets, and we all got screwed. And our parents were furious and you know yeah <laughs> that whole thing. was there un- but, yeah. was there was there anybody that was over 21 that could get in serious trouble for like yeah there was there was a yeah there was definitely a big group of people that were <laughs> at the same time that were getting like they, they weren't know, in like, charge though right <laughs> no but i mean they'll still give you a ticket for it they don't give a shit oh yeah but, they will, of course <laughs> but, yeah, they, uh, it was a uh, it was it was ske- it was still sketchy there was an element of danger there for sure <laughs> for, legally at least that was wild. Did you have a name for for the spot? Um, like the woods. I, we'll meet you at the I woods. Yeah, I can't remember. There was an actual name of the place, but I can't remember uh, off the top of my head. But it was, and we would change it up a lot. So it was, and sometimes it was in different spots. So we'd like go here and there and wherever, just to. You should do that again. Make, I mean, I that know. sounds so cool, man. Like especially yeah, now after COVID, like. Huh, I know. Let's do that. <laughs> Seriously, don't I mean, worry. Cops actually, don't listen to the show. At least yeah, co- yeah, your cops probably. Be <laughs> yeah, <we'll> be <laughs> be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I yeah, we could definitely do it a lot better these days. I mean, it was pretty debaucherous back then. Nowadays, the risks are different. You know, it's like back yeah. then you'd get you get a ticket, you would get slapped on the wrist, you get your parents, you get grounded maybe if you got caught by your parents or something. But like, uh-huh. yeah. seems like today. It's weird. Either you don't get caught at all, nothing happens, or you're in prison for like 20 years. Yeah, no shit, right? I know. It's like, it's like it, it definitely has changed. It's a little bit more hardline these days. At least that's how it seems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Remember that when you guys hit the Beyond the Lamplight tour in 20, yeah. 2022 or whenever you're you're planning. So let's talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's. I'd love to talk about the woods all night, but... Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to talk about Beyond the Lamplight and yeah, the recording session. Like, how did you guys record? Uh, and then let's talk about the songs too. Totally, yeah. Um, we um, we record our engineer and and studio owner is actually in the band. He's our drummer. Dane that Wood. helps. He owns, Sorry, what's yeah. his name? Uh, Dane Wood. He owns, the studio is called the Firing Room. It's an he's an incredible engineer. He just does a great job. And he did actually the last Flask record that we put out as well. Excellent. And he had, he actually sat in for Jamin, our drummer, on the last tour, the last Larry tour, because Jamin left the band before the very last tour. Um, so he he was in he was joined us with Larry on the last tour as well. So Dane's been around for a while and a close friend. And how uh, how versed is he in train punk? The train, train punk, punk, the train oh, punk yeah. beat that you you must was, have to yeah, do that was, quite often. That was definitely that was definitely a learning curve for him when he first when he sat, was sitting in for us with Jamin on the tour. It was like, well, you're gonna have to get used to doing this yep. all night, all night. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, but he's 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 great. He's an incredible drummer and super pro. Excellent. And so and a great engineer. So yeah, we, we did it out there at the firing room and what's uh, the studio like? What is it? Where is it it's at? A cool or you don't space. have to say it's where a, it is exactly, but yeah, it's, it's in here. Bend. It's here. It's East of Bend. Okay. Um, just out. It's kind of out in the, in the woods kind of at, at, it's in a, it's in a garage space that he completely converted into a full studio area, the decent sized live room and a nice little control room. And, uh, he lives above it. So it's like this all little contained little unit. And uh, it's great. It's an awesome place. It's, it sounds good. And he, he just knows the room so well because he's worked there so so much. And it just it's, it sounds awesome. And, uh, yeah, we did it. We just banged it out as fast as we could, to be honest. We just we, we had four songs and we were, we were like, all right, let's try to do this faster than we've ever recorded anything before. And we kind of like wanted to capture that like lightning in a bottle thing that like ha- that was like a really big thing in the beginning of, of when we were doing Larry stuff. We're like we kind of lost that toward like the last record, I think, in my opinion, with Larry, where like we took a lot of time on that album. And like the, the songs were like 
one, there were songs that we hadn't really woodshedded live. We hadn't really like done anything with them. We hadn't really played them at all, even all together. There were some songs that we had never even jammed, you know, that we were just like, okay, we'll just build it from the ground up in the studio. And we really took our time on that record. And it shows and it sounds cool, but there was just a sheen there that was just maybe like not quite the sound, you know, like mm -hmm. that, like, like I said, that lightning in a bottle thing where you just like, you just grab it. And that's like, it's this visceral thing that you can just like, it just sounds like you, I don't know, you just threw everything at the wall. Yeah. And so like, so we kind of, we kind of wanted to capture that with this recording. So we're like, let's just do everything as fast as possible. And we won't second guess our takes and we won't over, we won't add a bunch of overdubs and like do anything more than we really need to do than the songs really need kind of thing. And, and that's what we did. We just kind of just bang them out. And, uh, and I think that, I think it kind of, it, was it kind of did turn out that way it was like way more of a raucous kind of like looser vibe than some of the stuff that we've that we have done the la latter records with larry so mm -hmm. i i was stoked about it for sure no i i feel you on that like the lightning in the bottle like capturing the energy is yeah so easy to dampen down the more you put onto it the more you think about it the more you go mm -hmm. oh, oh this that yeah, I mean, I think the, the timeline is something too. Like the longer you take on it, like mm -hmm. the more everybody just kind of like, f like flat lines on excitement. Yes. You know, it's like it's like like you bring the song to the band and you like work it out together, and you're like, this is so rad! Like I can't wait till we can record it. And then you wait a year. <laughs> and then, yeah. You know, and then you tr and then you like it's finally together, and you're like, oh yeah, that song. I'm ready to move on. You yeah. Know, like I'm ready to write a whole new batch of songs because it's that like excitement of like having that thing that that's why you do it you know that's why you write music and that's why we get in, that's why we want to write songs and keep doing it and keep doing it because it's like that addicting feeling of like i can't wait to show this to the band or like like when you first work it out and you nail it in like a rehearsal before you're going into the studio or whatever and you're just like yep that's so badass yeah you know? and i want every song to be like that but it's just like yeah right can it i don't know it i guess it could but yeah, I mean, it could. I mean, it, it does vary. And I know it can't always be that way. And like, you know, it's a very romantic thing to like try to like, and it puts a lot of pressure on you and the whole band to like do that every time. Obviously, you can't, but like, but try as hard. I, I want to try as hard as I can from here on out to like kind of, kind of get that spark because it's just so fun to like just be throwing ideas around in the studio. Like, we're working on a vocal part in the studio, like, nah, nah, nah. yes, yes, go sing it. Like, yeah. you know, like kick him out into the live room and be like, go sing that. That's so good. Don't forget it, you know. And I th kind of thing. I think when you're talking about this kind of stuff too, you have to think of, of what kind of band, what kind of artist you are, what, what kind of music well, yeah, you're doing. And it's not pop dance music that has to be on the grid every time. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, obviously, it's, it's people that like storytelling, people that like nuance and they like, they don't want, yeah. so, you know, they don't want an, uh, a flown in chorus on every chorus. So it's exactly the same. They want a, a, a little bit, totally. you know, I hear the Very tone in, in Ian's voice on this and, and uh, yeah. I think just keeping that in mind is really important too. Is just like what? Who's the audience? And I think your yeah. audience wants real. They they want to know yeah. that you played that shit. Exactly, and like that's like I mean that's that was always been our thing, you know. Like just just you know you've seen us play before, and it's like it's all about that connection between us and the and the and the audience, you know. Like I'm I'm the first one down in the down in the crowd, you know, because I want just I just want to bring people into the moment, and that's like kind of what that's kind of what the music is about, you know? And like, cause that's the feel that we want to get across, like that everybody's kind of a part of it all at the same time. So, you know, it's a, to make it that as visceral as, as you can on the recording, it, it's really going to get that across more. Cause we spent a lot of time throughout the years with Larry kind of like just in a lot of like, and heard a lot of like negative feedback from a lot of people like, oh, it's just not the same, man. Like you just got to go see him live, you know, kind of thing where like the records just never really, did held it up for people because like the live experience for people was just too mm -hmm. there was too much of a connection there and like couldn't get past it and like they didn't like our records as much and it was like oh, well that's cool but don't you want to listen to our music like <laughs> <laughs> i spent a lot i spent a lot of time writing this yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't just want to see us jump up and down right <laughs> but there is yeah there is something about lot you know the live performance it's 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 more daring it's never going to happen again yeah, um, I, I can. I get that. Yeah, for sure. it was hard for Tumble Down too. You know, our records don't. I don't feel like we they live up to what we sound like live, yeah. because because of the fact that you know you guys can play 
exactly what you hear on that album you can play it live that's that's people yeah. are like what you know so like that's what i wanted tumble down to be too is like we we be able to play everything we put on a record totally. live and, and yeah. you know that's something that's hard it's so hard to capture i feel like even with mxpx our self-titled album that came out in 2018 we really kept that in mind uh we were going to record a live record we were gonna oh, like yeah. we had an idea like we're going to bring in a few you know a few audience mem you know pe close people that we know and put like a small crowd and actually yeah. record you know oh and man that'd be so cool with that pressure of like having a little bit of live audience there like that just give you that little extra push it, yeah yeah it gives you that nervous energy that you just don't have when you're just super relaxed and and totally. so that was the idea and we didn't do that obviously but we did we did try to capture what we what that idea yeah. was and so totally i mean I think it's I think it's so it's something that got neglected for a while for for me. I think I, I got I got really into production like and I started because I produced that last Larry record and then I produced I, I had another band with Dane and Andrew and our mandolin player Kirk called Woe Be Gone that we put out in that little break that I, we talked about a lot earlier. Woe Be um, Gone. Woe Be Gone. Yeah. And we that was like we were just like a rock a rock and roll band kind of like classic rockish kind of like dueling guitar harmonies thin lizzy kind thin of lizzy i was gonna say <laughs> good yeah yeah so like we had but and I, I helped produce that i produced that too and like I, I got really into production and like by the time we hit like this remedy larry's last album I, my head that was where my head was at way more than like capturing this like live thing and like now going back it's like yeah you can tell because i was just like there's a bunch of extra stuff we did a bunch of you know huge huge sounds and giant harmonies and keys and strings and you know like a bunch of stuff that was like okay that was fun that's like our sergeant pepper or whatever but yeah. <laughs> like we're not really that band you know yeah yeah and that's the thing is like that's all of that stuff is cool it's just a matter of what you find yourself doing at the time you know mm -hmm. i think it yeah. goes like this as an artist sometimes you want to work on crazy production sometimes you want to strip it way down um yeah. you know even art pop artists like uh like a uh, name one they all do like acoustic type performances and they'll release totally. something that's really stripped down in its own sort of pop vibe but yeah, um, yeah still. but yeah yeah like a justin justin uh bieber bieber i was yeah. trying to think of his last <laughs> Biebs. Yeah, Biebs. Yeah. he's great lot like li when he does live stuff uh he does some acoustic not he's not yeah. playing somebody else is playing the acoustic yeah, and he's yeah. singing or somebody will play the piano uh oh, and he's yeah, singing yeah. and it's like you and don't need all the craziness exactly and that and that is interesting like with those pop artists you get that connection and like uh, like just by stripping it down there's that like more Mm -hmm. like visceral connection between you and the artist by just by just taking away all those elements and stripping it down to that like one conversation between them and the audience you know and like and it it means you know that means a lot you know and you can feel it as a listener for sure absolutely so this mm -hmm. these new songs though um you know they they definitely follow along with the americana vibe and themes oh yeah uh, great lyrics what, what was the song uh what's done is done yeah dude it starts out hanging on till the morning light white knuckle grip not a soul in sight like right when i heard that i was like that reminded me of a th of my own life uh but specifically yeah. being in flagstaff uh <laughs> when when uh when i got married my, my i flew to dallas and got my wife and we loaded up a u-haul truck it had a governor on it so it only no. went like 70 miles an hour or oh, something like awful. that. Yeah, Just yeah, like, yeah. oh. Come on. I've been there, man. And we drove from Dallas, Texas to San Francisco, California. Uh, straight shot. Um, wow. I did it myself. I was like, I'm going to do this. I got this. 36 <laughs> hours later. Oh, my God. But the oh. hardest part was Flagstaff, Arizona. It was like 4 a.m. And the... I'm just hanging. I was basically what you just described in yeah, the song. I was exactly. hanging out. I was yeah. trying. Not, I was seeing things on the road. Like, like that wasn't really there, but I just saw that. Okay. Just keep going, keep going, you know, and yeah, having, totally, yeah. having read books <clears throat> about like dog sledding in Alaska, yeah. a, lo a lot of those guys on the Iditarod, they see things, you know, when they're oh, yeah. exhausted. And I was like, You're Oh, 
extremely sleep deprived like that. Yeah. That must have been what I was, what was happening. I was so sleep deprived that, because if we had only, yeah. we'd stop for gas and get food at the same time or bathroom and all that, and then keep going. Yeah. Like we weren't stopping at all. It's so I went 36 hours stop. in San Francisco, slept at, at uh, her relatives, and then we, the next day, drove to Seattle, Bremerton, Bremerton, wow. Washington. So, I mean, that was, but th those those kind of moments, like, solidify, when, when somebody can kind of have, like, a personal experience just from a line of one of your songs, to oh, me, man. that's, like, that's what you really, like, that's the holy grail of songwriting. That's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to connect people's lives, their real experiences with, something that you might have experienced but it's yeah really, yeah well yeah thank you, man. i love that by the way so it's a great that's, song that's, that means a lot man i mean i i you know it's like a work everything's like you know as a songwriter like everything's a work in progress and like it's kind of like you just kind of keep honing these things down you keep ch chiseling stuff off until you kind of get to the down to the bone and like just trying to figure it all out you know it's like sometimes some 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 lines are wins some sometimes yeah. aren't some other ones aren't as great you know like and sometimes you hit the jackpot you just you just never know but you just keep doing it until you know and 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 there's somebody out there who's gonna connect with that you know it's like and it's something i learned from i just recently with the, my other band old revival i started like co-writing with the with the songwriter of that band and just, <clears throat> and i hadn't done a lot of co-writing before but i really enjoy it and like i know you've done some some co-writing and done some like group session kind of stuff and like it's like it's really nice to have that like something to bounce some stuff off of like other people's so then like because i always i just second guess every single line i write you know it's like i can't i can't commit anything you know barely and to like write some bullshit that what i think is a bullshit line down or whatever and then have somebody be like that's really good dude i'll be like Really? You think so? You think we should just keep that? And to me, it was like a stock line that it was just a placeholder until I could find something else. It's like, okay, if you think it's good, then let's move on. You know, and it can like really speed up the process, which is kind of cool. Anyway, yeah, that is it. That is cool. Kind of a tangent, but no, but that's I mean, it's all songwriting and and, and how I mean, that's the thing is like, how do you really know when something's good? How do you personally know? I I could tell you right now how I know, but how do you know yeah. when to keep working on something? Um, well, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's pretty maybe boring and technical. I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's just comes down to like the minutia of the lines, you know, like we're like, you're not using anything that's like stale or tired or if you, or if you are using something that's like an old saying, it has to be used in a clever way or like something that everybody knows kind of thing. It's like, I just try not to be redundant and, and like, and try to, trying to think of new ways to say old stuff, you know, or like mm. it, you're trying to get like, like the human experience is something that we all, we all are going through. And it, there's been so many songs written about the things that everybody's been through, but like, how am I going to say it? It's going to be a new take on it. That's going to be, that's going to connect in maybe a slightly different way for someone else. Um, and I just try to like hone that in, I guess, and not try to make it too like, you know, too derivative of anything else. If I can help it or, yeah. or if you want, or, or sometimes on purpose, you know, right. And that's of part of, that's part of the song, you know, but like, like for me, it's like, how many to, times you know, can you write a drinking song? Apparently a lot because yeah, <laughs> there's exactly. a lot of great drinking songs. It's amazing. I know that's the thing. And like on this, on this, like on the beyond the lamplight EP, there's a drinking song, you know, it's like one of those like, yeah, come on. I mean, it's part, <laughs> It's part of the canon of my songwriting, I guess, where it's just like, there's got to be at least one drinking song. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I love it. It's uh, a great song, too. Yeah, thanks, man. <clears throat> it's just, it's fun. But So when does the EP come out? Um, that's going to be coming out July. I have to double 29th. Check. I actually wrote it. I wrote it down. No, it's uh, no. It got pushed back. July second. Oh. It, it said June 29th originally. That's when June. it was going to come oh. out, but we pushed it back just a little bit. So it's July second. Um, yeah, like and July the second 2nd. single. That's a pretty good day. Second single is uh, June 11th, so it's coming out just on Friday. Oh, okay, this okay, Friday. awesome. It'll be out probably by the time this at ears. It will. Yeah, this will come out yeah. Monday. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So. So wow. yeah, I mean, I'm stoked on on how it all turned out. I'm, are you guys doing, what, what kind of promotion are you doing? Is it different than what you've done in the past for, for other releases? Yeah, I mean, right now we're kind of struggling to get a foothold, to be honest. I mean, it was like, it's kind of a weird time to re, 
I, I don't want to say rebrand would be the wrong word, but like kind of a weird time to kind of like shift gears with kind of, cause it's kind of like, it's my songwriting, which is essentially like that sound, you know I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it's like kind of getting Larry fans over to be like, Hey, check this out. Like, this is like, if you like that, this is pretty much that still kind of thing. Yeah. But to try to get that kind of to come over has been a little bit of a struggle, you know, like um, I think that right now we're, we're, we're really just trying to get in front of people once we get some, shows start happening again you know mm-hmm. like just kind of creating like a like a grassroots buzz kind of thing yeah because <clears throat> that, i think that that's the only way it's the only way it's gonna really happen and you're we're gonna actually make real fans because right now we have one single out and it's like other than that it's like asking people to come and be a part of this on total blind faith it's like why you know it's like we have one song and like we won't have that much music so people just have to come out and see it at this point yeah i think um we're not you know we're doing a, a we're not doing like a crazy amount of promotion. It's really, it's hard because we're not in a super great position to, to hit it really hard. Cause we're all like family men and we got shit going on and other bands, you know, like our banjo players in three bands and like, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in on one other band and we're all trying to juggle this other stuff. So it's like, you know, trying to make it work where we can. And yeah, we definitely want to hit it. I want to hit it harder than I have in a few years for sure. Once the things kind of start moving and we can get out and start yeah. playing shows. I'd love to do if just get in front of some people and rock it. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. What kind of promo would you do these days? Like, I guess you could do magazines and articles, but like people don't generally read those. Even if, I know. even if it's a Rolling Stone, like yeah. people will be like, that's cool. And they won't read it. They literally the won't headline. read it. So yeah, yeah that, that's, that's that's all that's all they see and like oh they're in the Rolling Stones like what what did it say I don't know <laughs> like, I, just, I read the comments that. though <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um, so yeah it's weird I, I think that like the only thing these days the a big thing these days is like making some sort of like fun video or something you know like where something that people can see that's like you know that's eye catching that there's something you know something that for, uh, for a yeah. lot of people lot of people to like or like controversial or like there's always there's always got there's always got to be an edge on something you know for people to kind of like stop scrolling to catch sure catch the video you know and like like what about a documentary or making a video of like you guys in the studio did you film it all a little bit we didn't do a ton of filming because we worked so quickly it was like we just were we were focusing solely on the music and just trying to get it you know get it committed as quickly as possible so like there's not a lot of footage from behind the scenes of that we we did some in studio we did an in studio video live performance video out at that studio as well which we've ha- we have got the what's done is done we have edited and ready to release we're going to release that it's just us playing awesome. it live in the studio um we just did uh this little online uh festival called based in Portland called Bridge City Fest. And they did this, they do like a concert series called yep. Bridge City Sessions. I've heard of that, um, that's good. Yeah, and uh, so we did that. It's a 30 minute set that's gonna be airing this on um, the 12th. Um, so it will have already aired by the time this comes out, but. Um, so but you're you doing buy, you stuff, you're doing stuff. Yeah, we're doing it's stuff. Getting we, got in. Shows com- we got some shows coming up. We just we just played like our first show back, like our first real show in like a year and a half at our local venue here. Um, at Volcanic Theater, and uh, it was uh, it was awesome. It was like you know it was like real show again, which was amazing, and that went well. We sold it out, so it was like it was an awesome show, and and so and we got some stuff coming up around the area these next coming months. But but yeah, yeah. we're just trying to trying to do it, just trying yeah. to get out there. It's been fun though to just get into it again. Yeah, just try to film any all your shows, film all those, and. Splice yeah. them up, you know, in, any good takes of a song, splice that into it and start on your YouTube and, and you know, totally. everything really. But yeah, it's a, it's a grind. I mean, it's, it's it really not, is. it's yeah. a lot of work, but I'm that's learning a lot about it. And I'm like watching you doing all this, all the promotional stuff that you do for, for MXPX and for your podcast is like, that's, that's admirable. It's like, you know, like to do, I just, I just need a better like schedule <laughs> with it. Like I just need to like sit down and actually do it. I'm, I'm so reactive. So it's like, I'm instantly like, Oh shit, I didn't do this. I got to do this right now. And then I have to think <laughs> of something off the top of my head, like yeah. immediately. Cause that's, I have to do it right now. It's like, and that's how my life has been for like the past, you know, six months or so or whatever. Cause I just been trying to get this band off the ground. So every little thing, you know, is like, how do I get a hold of Mike Herrera? I want to talk on his podcast. Like, you know, and I'm like for the next, and then for the next 48 hours, I'm like pulling out my hair. Cause like, you know, I'm waiting on an email. It's not your fault, but it's just like, that's me. My oh, anxiety, God. like craziness of like, don't wait, don't email. wait on an email from me. I don't check <laughs> yeah, it often. Totally. Yeah, totally. And like, 
it, that's but that's just me, you know. So I just need to think of a. I just need a better regimen. I think my wife can probably agree with me on that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was gonna add one of the things I like to talk about is is routines, day to days, week to week. It de depends on you know who it is, but um, you're saying that you kind of don't really have a routine with the music stuff, or or is that yeah. You I mean, I don't, I mean, other than just outside of rehearsals, which we have, you know, like twice a week, twice a week, one with either band at the moment. And, uh, other than that, it's been, I just kind of, I do it. I kind of take it as it comes other than like, you know, we have a schedule when it comes to the releases mm -hmm. and I'm working with our label flail records out of Portland and just kind of like, you know, coordinating that stuff. But as far as like a day to day routine that I do with like promotion and stuff like that, I kind of, I don't, which I need, I've really been thinking about it lately. Like, just like, I, I gotta, I gotta lock something down because it's starting to pretty, it's trying to, it's a lot of wear and tear. <laughs> yeah. But uh, just stress wise. Absolutely. I feel like I'm sure there's a lot, well, there's a lot that I don't get done. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I feel like I, I literally com compartmentalize so much that. That's the only way I could really get this yeah. done. Like, how am I writing a song? You know, that's the one thing that's hard is you have a song I song you're writing, but you can't work on it because you're like, I got to get this done, but I, I have an idea I want to try, and it's in the back of your head. Isn't that frustrating? That is the most wow. frustrating, I think. It's like the music is like, and I'll t usually, because I'm, I'm such a scatterbrain, I'll just put every, I'll throw everything else aside so I can write the song. Sure, you know, because, which you should. Because like, Cause it's just like, <laughs> if I don't like it's all about that spark, like, and I'm going to lose, if I'm going to lose that, like, no way I got to like, I got to hit that now. I got to go for it, you know? Yeah. Um, which is to my detriment. Cause I end up forgetting or losing track of all the other important shit that I probably should be doing too, you know? So it's like, it's a balance and I'm working on it. I, I make it sound like I'm a complete nut job. I'm, I have <laughs> most of it under control. Don't, don't worry. But, but I definitely envy people like yourself that can kind of like, keep things at least somewhat in order. <laughs> like, wow. Well, yeah. I, it looks good, I guess, but <laughs> you do a great job making it look good. At least at least there's that. I'm a little bit like you where I, I, I do things as they come in, you know? And so yeah. because of that, I, that's why I don't let things come in. Like, that's why I don't have my phone on, on like where it has any sound or vibration. It's like, if I don't look at it, it doesn't exist and that's fine. So yep. things like that, I've made that, that those changes and it really helps. And, and it's, totally. but it's still, it's never going to be serene. I'm sure it's always going to be, we, we like I a mean, little bit of chaos. I think that, yeah, exactly. And I think that like, <laughs> I think that there's always an element of that in what we do, you know, it's like, and yeah. that's part of the, I think that's part of the reason why we love to do what we do. There's all, something's always going to go wrong. And that's so like masochistic to like, mm -hmm. even like be into that, but it's like part of like growing up touring and, and like being a part of a band and like all those things. Um, if, it's just, there's always that element of surprise that you never know. And it could be the shittiest thing that happens, but yeah. for some reason we just keep coming back, you know, and keep doing it and keep like, cause there's always going to be that little twist on this, on the situation. And you're just going to have to roll with it when it happens. And I don't know, it's part of the allure, I guess, the little bit of danger. Yeah. <laughs> or something, you know? Well, you know, when people ask, you know, how, what's your, what's your advice for, you know, getting into the music business and, you know, being successful as a band and this, 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 uh, advice is going to self-destruct in five years when self-driving cars take over. But I would say back in the day learning, like if you were a mechanic, like you should always have a mechanic in your band because the van is constantly breaking and it's things that can be fixed. Usually most of the oh, time. Easily. Yeah. Usually. But we didn't know how I to agree. do it. No, me either. I mean, like we had like very s small amount of knowledge too, like, you know, and that we could change our own oil if we had to or something, you know, like change <laughs> yeah. a tire, you know, like that's the extent of it. it, you know, beyond that. It's like, yeah, we never had anybody that was really good with good with vehicles and yeah that's definitely one of those like yeah. <laughs> first learn how to be a mechanic second then go on the road you yeah know? Like, yeah yeah totally. then learn how I to agree. play what so oh, i was going to ask like you know the day-to-day -day stuff people don't even realize you're trying to get you know songwriting done or whatever you're doing yeah sometimes you don't even have a your guitar you know you you need to change your yeah. strings or you know your, your yep. guitar strings break or whatever like i run into that all the time where i'm just like having to do these maintenance things and I don't even have the right tools, my base, I'm, I'm trying to change the action on it. 
and I've yeah, lost yeah, all my working. tools. So like life is chaotic no matter what. So you would think that, that I have everything under control, but I, I do the podcast and I try to make, make sure that happens. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> everything else. Well, that's really who knows? Yeah. You, you make it look good though. It's, it's great. <laughs> But that's, you know, all of these things, I, I think, as a songwriter, help you connect to just everyday issues and everyday, you know. I think so, too. Yeah, I mean, it, it feeds into that kind of, you know, into that well that you that we keep dipping into, you know. It's yeah. like you keep filling it up with these experiences and these, like, issues and problems and, like, hang-ups and, and good and bad, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and you just keep filling that well that you can dip into and then it just becomes like richer and richer as you, as you keep dipping because all these experiences keep accumulating in there. And then yeah. I think that that's why, I mean, it's obvious, you know, it's, it's a no brainer why song, your just songwriting gets better as you get older because like you just have that many more experiences to draw from. Not to say that there aren't great young songwriters that can write songs way beyond their years, you know, um, but at the same time, it, Gen generally, you, you, it, as I got older, from my perspective, my songwriting got better. You know, I agree because there's just there's yeah. just more experiences and and your priorities change and and you start to you know see see life from a different angle. You know, yeah. There's there's all you know there's always a a caveat to that. And I would say when <laughs> yeah. you get super rich and you're not focused on the music anymore. Yeah, that you may be it. older, but your your songwriting could change, or or if you're too focused on the fame part of it, or a lot of artists too many write. Yes a, men. Yeah, well, they write. Yeah, too many yes men. You know, if you have catering, not that there's anything yeah. wrong with that, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about like, you know, if you're if you have only if your experiences are only like, um, I only want red M and M's in the bowl and sports yeah. cars and luxury you know all this stuff like if that's what you're writing about that's cool but then your audience is going to change you know your your audience is like oh totally confused of we're gonna see that it started out like you know they're talking about skid row and all this and then now they're talking about you know so uh -huh. i think that kind of like what you're talking about that's exp new experiences for that whoever that artist is you know if it's yeah whoever even bart simpson you know when he got really really famous yeah. on the simpsons and he's like uh huh. Yeah. My yeah. my bloody fans are pukes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's a great one. That's but classic. that's exactly basically what I'm talking about. Is like yeah. if you have those experiences, that's going to change who you are a little bit too. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to like you know feed it. That's going to be what you're filling your well up with. And then you're, when you it's your well's not going to be very deep. Yeah. Be scraping. Just gonna be scraping the bottom, and there's not a lot to talk about, you know. And then therefore, all your fans are that are about that deep too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know something that like back in the day. Now that I'm thinking about it, the old school image of like a rock star would be drunk in your giant mansion with your robe, and like yeah. not really doing anything. But nowadays, it's like hip hop has sort of become mainstream, and and now it's cool to talk about you know how much money you have, but everybody's up, up, up. So now you're not depressed and, you know, yeah. lonely. You're having a party. Either way, you know, it's different experiences. You write songs about that and, and that's what goes uh -huh. forward. But True, true. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. But here just we are. We're, we're, what are you writing about? <laughs> just try to, yeah, just try to keep it interesting. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what's done is done is great. Um, I don't quite know the no other songs' names. Uh, yeah, um, but the they drink, were all drink great. It on, drink it on down is the drinking song, which is a pretty obvious title for that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's a song called "True Redeemer" on it. That's the one with the pedal steel intro, kind of um, the real melodic one. Mm -hmm. That one I really like. That one was a weird one lyrically. That's a weird one. It's kind of like I do. A, I do a fair amount of story songs too, where like I kind of like use some of my own own experiences and mix it in with kind of like a like a weird weird storyline and sometimes i don't even know what, what the storyline is going to be by the, sure. by the time the song is done and then i have to like look at it and be like oh this is kind of about that but th this oddly turned out to be like it's about like a serial killer i suppose that like sets people free by which, which one mur by murdering them it's called true redeemer, true redeemer. and uh, it's like it's that as far as I can tell, that's what it's about. <laughs> it's one of those ones that like it came out and I was like, I think that's what that's about. But like, um, it's kind of a story song just about an individual who's, you know, not right. And it's kind of interesting, but yeah, sometimes those ones come out every now and then where it's like this crazy, huh? That was cool. Yeah. Or, or, or not. I don't know. It was something. So when you're uh, writing lyrics, do you, do you often just go 
with a melody and a line and that's oh that's interesting to me and so you try to like associate other lines with it what would go yeah. well next what would go yeah, next sometimes. and you don't know what yeah. you're doing you you only know what's happening next you don't necessarily know what's going to be yeah you know, sometimes i mean i've experimented with writing like full lyrics before I even write a melody, like doing like oh, okay. straight up poetry and then writing music. Um, I've only done that a handful of times. Usually it's an all at once thing for me where like I'll, I'll sit down with, uh, with a riff or progression and I'll usually think of the melody first and I'll just start to sing it. I'll uh, get this kind of cool melody going. And then sometimes I'll scat a little bit to kind of get like a cool cadence mm -hmm. going on a, on a thing. And then I'll just fit some, and then I'll start fitting words to it. And then, yeah. And then it, once the first line goes to something that's associated or carries the story and then it just goes from there kind of thing. And then when I usually do it, I know people that jump around and like do like do both verses first and then go back and do a chorus. So then it all like ties everything in, which is a good idea, but I don't do that. I've done that before. <laughs> just, I don't always yeah, do yeah. that, but I've, I've done that plenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, but usually I'll just go straight through it. So I'll just do one, mm. you know, one verse, you know, pre or no chorus, and then the, and then we go from there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, 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 sometimes it's stream of consciousness. Like the whole solo record um, is like all of that writing was pretty stream of conscious writing, where like I just kind of let it go where it wanted to go, and then I kind of looked at the page and was like, oh. That's just, that's what that song's about. Like almost every song on the record's like that. I was, it was a totally different style of writing than I was kind of used to. And I kind of let myself do that on purpose. So the, so the songs were just that much more different from what I do in other bands and, and what I've done previously too. So, so I, ex I experiment with, with songwriting as often as I can, but my usual formula is just like get in. And I always like to finish in one set when one sitting, cause if I don't, then just the vibe is just almost impossible to bring back when it's halfway done. I, I can do it, but sometimes it actually makes it better if you wait and like come back to it. But in my experience, I just like to get it all out in one shot and then call it. There you go. I like that too. But, it, so with, with what's done is done, the new single, did you write yeah. the verse first or did you write the, maybe the, when did you write that as opposed to the, the very intro, like the, the riff on the intro? Um, that started that started as the riff i think i think i thought of that riff first and then i was like oh that's cool that sounds like classic me and then, yeah because you know, i was gonna then, say like in my experience when i write uh, when i write a really interesting riff it's usually the first thing but if i yeah. write the riff like after the whole song it's usually it's usually just like a little, like a little extra instrumental thing. It doesn't have so cool. much character, but yours has a lot of. I'd love yeah. to hear it. Do you? Would you? Would you mind sure. playing it acoustic? Yeah, I can play it for sure. I think uh, everybody'd be stoked. We'll, yeah, uh, we'll end. Uh, we'll end on that. But uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, um, here I'm gonna I'm gonna unplug here so I sure. can be a little freer. So I, don't try to talk to me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's done is done. I'm going to try this. Hopefully I don't screw it up too bad. Hanging on till the morning light. White knuckle grip, not a soul inside. Being lucky's never been my style. Always made my way walking single file. Uphill is the only way that I know. Looking back, what do I have to show? Deep scars, bright stars, and all the pain I kept to the chart. Good friends, dead ends, love gives a hand. Sinner's pride, my hat in hand, can I apologize? I'm happy living day by day, but the finer things never come my way. Chipping at it is all that I can do. In the mirror, who's staring back? What's
let it slip away, away, away. Deep scars, bright stars, and all the pain I kept in a jar. Good friends, dance. Love gives a hand to lend. Well done, man. I'll, I'll wait for you to put your ears back in. <laughs> oh. That was great. Yay, thanks. <laughs> I try to ha kind of hack that one, but hey. No, I mean, okay. yeah, the the, uh, the signal is a little funky too, but oh, but it's weird. your voice sound sounds really great. And and thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's that's that's really cool to hear live. Can't wait for it. I, that that song yeah. gets in your head, man. It's really catchy. Really well done. I uh, encourage everybody to go check it out. Beyond the Lamplight. What's done is done. You can add that to your libraries right now. Um, yeah. Follow on Instagram at Beyond the Lamplight. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Beyond the Lamplight. And no Twitter? You got a Twitter? Uh, no Twitter. Not, no not Twitter. Yet. I don't know why. <laughs> I haven't ho I've never hopped on the, tr the Twitter train. Twitter's just kind of, you know, it's just the other main, main thing. It's there. You know? Yeah, I it's guess there. I'll just have to do that now. I, I, w I would, yeah, if you're wanting to get out into the world. But, you know, yeah. you don't have to actually check your Twitter. That's that's yeah. that's not, it's not a that's, that's needed. Not but, it's about. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. you can just post things. Anyway, yeah, dude, that was so good. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you, it. Great to catch up with you and really actually kind of get to know you a little better. It was cool. I know, yeah. We never really talked a ton, you know. It was like, it was, it was, I feel like that night when we first saw it, when we first met each other, when we played together at least, it was like, it was like a whirlwind. I don't know what, what it was. It was like, we came in and I felt like I, we barely talked and it was like, done. Yeah, yeah. I think Seattle's rough because, uh, you know, the ferry schedules, it might have been like, oh, we got to hit, hit the ferry, see you later, you know, yeah. something like that. But yeah, yeah. yeah that, that happens totally. to us a lot. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank Can't. you. This is great. It's, it's awesome. I love, the, I love the podcast. I listen to it all the time. And uh, Dude, so, thank yeah. You. Keep up, keep the good, keep up the good work, and uh, you as maybe well. we'll see you, see you sometime soon. Come down to Bend. Yeah, uh, if I'm ever down there, I'll good, hit you up for sure. Good, good beer and uh, hang out. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Right on. All right, peace All right, out. Dude. Be on the lamplight. See you later, Mike. Keep keep those tunes coming. We will. All right.